Hi, I'm Achila Bagal, and I'm the editor of the 2019 monograph issue of Radiographics, which is focused on neuroradiology emergencies. Today, I'm pleased to have with us Drs. Andrew Schweitzer and Dr. John Churias from the Department of Radiology at New York Presbyterian Hospital Cornell Medical Center. They are the first and the last authors on one of our featured papers in the monograph issue of Radiographics. And the paper is entitled, Traumatic Brain Injury Requisites for the Radiologist. Dr. Schweitzer and Churius, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Dr. Bagal. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Of course. So one of the reasons we chose this paper as our featured paper is that traumatic brain injury is truthfully bread and butter for the radiologist, right? Whether it is a neuroradiologist, whether it's a general radiologist, and your paper really highlights some of the important things that our readers, our audience uh, needs to know. And so let's just start by um, one of the first things that your papers actually points out. And you talk about the American Academy of Neurology concussion guidelines, right? And understanding the importance of differentiating concussion from TBI. And we all know concussion is obviously a very hot topic. We have got a lot of media attention of sports-related injuries. Can you summarize for our listeners these guidelines on concussion? Sure. Um, so uh, to start, uh, the terminology uh, can be very confusing. So um, I'll do my best uh, to simplify it. Um, concussion uh, can be thought of as falling under the umbrella um, of TBI. Um, and in many places, uh, concussion and uh, a mild TBI, which is defined as a Glasgow Coma Scale of uh, 13 to 15, uh, are used interchangeably. Uh, for instance, in the uh, VA Department of Defense uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines, um, they explicitly state that those two can be used um, interchangeably. Um, the distinction really uh, uh, comes uh, where, where you know concussion has a more uh, transient connotation, um, and so concussion has been suggested to avoid um, a potential stigma um, uh, associated with having a quote uh, brain injury. Okay. Um, so, uh, for uh, uh, with respect to those um, uh, American uh, Academy of Neurology uh, guidelines uh, pertinent to the radiologist, um, so one concussion is a clinical diagnosis, um, and there are scales that can assist the clinician in uh, reaching that diagnosis. Um, that assess things like orientation, uh, immediate memory after the trauma, um, concentration, uh, delayed recall, balance, uh, things like that. Um, and much of the recommendations um, pertain to uh, pre-participation uh, counseling uh, for athletes um, to understand before participating in their respective sports, um, uh, kind of an informed consent before uh, participation. Um, uh, as well as um, management of a diagnosed concussion once it is uh, once that uh, diagnosis has been established, um, including things like return to play and when it's safe for an athlete to return to play, um, and even in patients with recurrent uh, concussions, uh, retirement from play. Um, and there there is a, a brief but important part regarding imaging, um, and so most pertinent to the radiologist. Um, CT uh, should not be used for uh, diagnosis of concussion, but it might be obtained uh, to uh, rule out a more serious TBI, um, such as uh, intracranial hemorrhage um, in an athlete uh, with more concerning clinical features uh, who's suspected uh, to, to potentially have um, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, features like loss of consciousness, uh, amnesia, uh, persistent uh, alteration of mental status, uh, any focal neurologic deficit um, on physical exam, uh, evidence of skull fracture, or any signs of clinical deterioration. Um, so really, rather than differentiating um, concussion from TBI, it, uh, imaging plays a role in evaluating uh, for intracranial lesions that may indicate a more serious uh, TBI. Well, that, that's great, and it's, I think it's very important to uh, differentiate, so this was, this was very useful for us to understand. Um, and it actually segues into a, uh, one of my next questions. You mentioned skull-based fractures, and in the paper also, you highlight the importance of looking at the dural sinuses 
in the presence of skull base fractures, right? Especially for the fractures that are in close approximation to the venous sinuses, because we can have venous thrombosis or we can have venous epidurals. In fact, in the paper, figure four is a great example of such a case. So can you take us through this and again, explain why we have to pay importance to the sinuses? Absolutely. Um, so uh, in figure 4a, uh, this was a patient who was assaulted and was uh, hit in the back of the head with a tire iron um, and who sustained a, uh, a midline occipital fracture that's <laughs> actually non-displaced that you see here in figure 4a um, and actually travels anteriorly to involve the um, left carotid canal. Um, and in figure 4b, um, pertinent to the dural venous sinus, um, you can see that subjacent to the um, uh, non-displaced midline occipital fracture, there is a lenticular um, extraaxial hyperattenuation that's consistent with uh, a venous epidural hematoma, um, which on the CT venogram, we, which is uh, uh, for figure 4C, you can see uh, the axial CT venogram focused on that area. You can see that the venous epidural hematoma is compressing and narrowing the um, underlying uh, right transverse sinus. Um, and uh, while that, yes, that, uh, that uh, hemorrhage is hyperattenuating, it's of course less hyperattenuating than the idonated contrast in that narrowed right transverse sinus. Um, and you know, more, more generally, um, these injuries have been probably under-recognized um, in the past. Um, and you know, from more recent literature, uh, when a fracture tra uh, tra does traverse a dural venous sinus, in only about one third of cases is that sinus completely normal. So it's it's actually more common to have some abnormality in the underlying sinus. Um, so um, when when you see a, a purely smooth extrinsic sinus compression, you can favor a purely uh, venous uh, epidural uh, hematoma. Uh, which is which happens in about half of the cases where a fracture traverses the dural venous sinus, um, and and radiologist awareness of of this uh, venous epidural is uh, particularly important as these are much more conservatively managed um, than arterial epidurals um, by our neurosurgical colleague. Um, uh, in contrast to when you see kind of purely smooth extrinsic sinus <clears throat> compression, when you do see a discrete luminal filling defect you can favor um, a component of thrombus. And kind of looking at the studies that looked at this, a range over five studies was a rate of anywhere from 23 to 41%. So that's also um, probably more common than a lot of, um, uh, a lot of us expected. Um, th this, uh, it al they also can be mixed, venous epidural and thrombus. And it's also important to note that these can be very difficult to distinguish fr um, from one another, and it's gonna be indeterminate in uh, in the literature, some 10 to 20 percent of cases where you, you can identify an abnormal sinus, but you can, can't really say how much is due to a venous epidural versus thrombus. Yeah, and it's, and it's great that you point out the high percentage of these injuries. Um, again, for the trainees in the audience, I think this is a good point to remember. It should be in the checklist. Um, and, you know, I found in, in, our, uh, in, in our practice that many times the CTA can actually be very helpful because the venous opacification is there. A purely arterial phase is difficult, and you don't always necessarily need to do a CTV if you're already doing CTA. Have you guys found a similar pattern that you can assess it mostly in quite a high number of cases? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe, I mean, one of my big things is you want to always minimize radiation exposure. So um, in a patient who has a skull-based fracture like that, I think the CTA is perfectly adequate because usually transit time is about three seconds from artery to vein. Um, especially if there's a laceration there, it's going to be even quicker. So you don't really need that CTV. Uh, occasionally, a follow-up MRI with an MRV may be useful uh, to better characterize whether it's arterial or venous so or whether there's thrombus present as well. Perfect. Okay, so moving on. Um, one of the other highlights of the paper is that it describes these diffuse axonal injuries, again, an important component of TBI. And we know that these are from axonal stretch or shear, um, and that they predominantly affect the highly organized white matter tracts in the gray-white matter junction. 
your paper is providing these details about the utility of MR and the various grades of axonal injury. Again, it's an important component of something that the radiologist should know. Uh, can you please walk us through these grades of uh, the diffuse axonal injuries? Absolutely. Um, so uh, first I'll kind of give an overview of the three grades and then I'll go into examples uh, of each. Um, so grade one um, involves the subcortical white matter um, and there is a predominance uh, for, of the uh, involvement of the frontal subcortical white matter um, as the axis of rotation of the head is posterior. So the frontal lobes um, uh, experience the highest rotational forces and that's more the most likely location to get that shear or stretch injury. Um, so grade one, subcortical white matter. Uh, grade two, uh, involving the corpus callosum. And grade three, uh, involving the brain stem. And so the highest grade kind of supersedes the presence of any of the lower grades. Um, and certain other, it's uh, another uh, asterisk uh, when discussing the grades is that it doesn't include um, all potential lesions that may be clinically relevant. Um, uh, for instance, in the um, uh, literature, thalamic lesions, uh, which are not part of that grading system, are associated with uh, a poor outcome uh, uh, when they're present. Um, but going, to, going through some uh, examples um, of uh, the different grades of diffuse axonal injury, um, in figure 19, um, that, uh, 19A shows uh, in this young woman uh, with a head trauma, uh, a normal head CT, um, but she uh, continued having a, a persistent confusion, and that's when an MRI was ordered, and um, which shows uh, in uh, 19B, an uh, axial SWI image shows two foci susceptibility hypointensity in the right frontal subcortical white matter, and on um, image C, the, the um, corresponding quantitative susceptibility map image, um, they're hyper intense, so these are consistent with um, micro hemorrhages. Um, 19D shows a, um, the, that DWI in this particular case uh, was, was negative. There was no DWI abnormality. Um, 19E shows um, that uh, there was a very subtle T2 flare abnormality, subtle T2 flare hyper intensity. It's important to note that um, you can get uh, DWI um, abnormality without uh, hemorrhage. Um, and that, uh, in the, with the right history and the right location, that can be suspicious for an axonal injury. Um, but uh, figure 19 is, is actually a good example uh, to your question, um, when is MRI useful? And it's a, it's a, it's a key question. Uh, and I, and I, this is a good example of where MRI is clearly uh, indicated um, and literature supports a class one recommendation in cases like this. In a patient with head trauma where the head CT is negative and, then, and there are persistent um, unexplained uh, neurologic findings. And in this case, it, it, it gave us a reason why. Yeah, that, that being said, though, um, it may give you the reason, but it actually mm -hmm. rarely changes patient management. Patient mm -hmm. management is almost entirely based on that CT scan. So the MRI scan may give you additional information um, to talk to the patient about or their family, but it's not really going to change their management or their treatment because you're going to treat primarily the patient's clinical symptoms and signs um, that were present, regardless of what the MRI shows. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's probably why the, the AAN guidelines, they don't even mention MRI at all in their, um, in their guidelines. Um, mm -hmm. in, um, so uh, to, to look at an example of grade two um, uh, axonal injury, um, figure 20 uh, shows an example. This was a uh, clearly positive case on CT. Um, in a patient uh, who had a focal hematoma in the body of the uh, corpus callosum, as you see on these axial and sagittal CT images. Um, this patient did, um, uh, for whatever reason, end up getting an MRI, and it showed uh, kind of expected findings of uh, T2, surrounding T2 flare uh, hyperintensity that you see um, in uh, images C and D, and expected susceptibility hypointensity um, in uh, figure E, and F shows that in this case, there was um, a, a, diff a corresponding diffusion abnormality, some of which may be attributable to artifacts from the hematoma, but some of which could be you know, direct evidence of neuronal death um, that we're imaging. 
Yeah, and, and actually, it's interesting about this case. In my experience, when you see a micro hemorrhage on the uh, CT scan that looks like a, an external injury, um, typically the MRI scan is much more positive. You'll see many more micro hemorrhages on the MR that you did not see on the CT scan. In this particular case, actually, the only hemorrhage that we saw on the CT scan was also hmm. uh, the only hemorrhage we saw on the MRI scan. So they actually correlated very nicely. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes mm -hmm. what you see on CT uh, is just the tip of the iceberg. Correct. Correct. And so for uh, figure 21, um, this shows uh, a chronic example of um, grade 3 uh, diffuse axonal injury. So what makes it grade 3 uh, DAI is what we see in figure B, which is uh, susceptibility hypointensity involving the Mid dorsal midbrain, and we're probably getting into a bit of the pons here. So there's dorsal brainstem involvement, and that may, makes this a, a grade three diffuse axonal injury. Um, but uh, the SWI images in in uh, figures D and E show uh, both colossal and subcortical white matter um, uh, extensive uh, hemorrhages as well. Um, uh, this patient. Uh, uh, did have corresponding um, uh, in, in figure C, you can see atrophy um, on, uh, on T2 flare um, in the posterior corpus callosum and of the midbrain, um, and then developed and chronically um, bilateral hypertrophic olivary uh, degeneration uh, as yeah, seen in figure yeah, F. These images are in the subacute to chronic stages in this patient. These are not acute, and that's why you're seeing the atrophy here of the midbrain and the corpus callosum, as well as the hypertrophic olivary degeneration from brain stem injury. No, these these are great examples, and you know can can walk us through the different uh, grading. Um, a question is: Do you use the grading um, in your reports? Um, I can tell you, uh, we we actually don't specifically state the grading. What we do do, and I, what I think is the most useful for the clinicians, is that we specifically outline where the injuries are. Uh, okay. So um, and and then the clinicians can can you know take from that. Uh, what they will, and either try to correlate it with uh, with uh, between structure and function, or just give them an idea of the overall severity uh, of the injury. Yeah. All right. Um, just building on the discussion on MRI, um, DTI diffusion tensor imaging um, has been around and has been used for TBI research for now almost twenty years. Um, However, we still don't use this advanced imaging in our everyday clinical practice. So two questions related to this. Number one is, what are the major barriers of using DTI in clinical practice? And number two question is, what is the future looking like for DTI and TBI? Okay, now that is a loaded question. It <laughs> is, and that's why I'm asking to the experts. Exactly, it's a loaded and, 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 and a quite a quite a controversial question, actually. So I'll I'll try to keep my uh, my comments as uh, as clean and as uh, politically correct as possible. Um, but um, yeah, so the bottom line is is that um, up until now there are hundreds of papers that have used diffusion tensor imaging for the assessment of uh, traumatic brain injury of all severity and grades. Um, unfortunately, there are some huge barriers to use it, to, to translate it from the research arena, the investigational side, into um, actual clinical practice. That's not to say that some people aren't doing it already. I don't condone that. I don't agree with it. But it, it is being done out there by certain individuals. Um, but the major problems, um, primarily, current, like, as far as the current problems are, that there are no standards and guidelines at all for what best practices are for acquiring, post-processing, and analyzing DTI data. So no one, everyone does it differently. No one does it the same. And the American College of Radiology, um, the, um, the FDA, et cetera, has not put together anything that would um, uh, guide our clinicians, our radiologists out there, on how to do it as best as possible. Although there is an RSNA initiative, um, part of Chiba, that is working on this um, that I'm just recently gotten involved in that is going to try to put together some sort of standards and guidelines. So that's the first thing. Um, the research that has currently um, been published on this, unfortunately, is very heterogeneous. And that has to do with the fact that there are no standards and guidelines. So the studies that have been published 
have imaged um, patients using DTI with mild traumatic brain injury using multiple different techniques, including uh, ROI analysis, voxel-based analyses, tractography, uh, track-based spatial, spatial uh, statistics, and they have also imaged them with different grades, uh, severity grades of traumatic brain injury and different times after the injury. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to pull this data um, that is available for us. And there have been some meta-analyses done that have been very limited because of that, because of the heterogeneity in what we see in the currently published literature. And when you look at the meta-analyses, um, it doesn't really tell you much. There was one meta-analysis that was done a few years back out of Japan that basically showed that the only place that there was any consistent abnormalities in TBI was the corpus callosum, for example, even though we know that there are many more abnormalities outside the corpus callosum. So that's, that's the first problem. Uh, another major problem is that um, the technique itself is extremely sensitive. It's sensitive to every microstructural variation, not, not necessarily abnormality, but variation in the white matter of an individual's brain because it's compared to a control group. So um, if in, in one specific individual, you can have a lot of differences in your white matter DTI uh, metrics just based on the fact that you're different from the control group. And there are a lot of reasons why people are different. And unfortunately, it does not make a good test for an individual with mild TBI for that specific reason, because it's so sensitive, and yet at the, on the flip side, it's completely nonspecific. Mm -hmm. So basically, most, and most DTI studies you're gonna do in anyone, regardless of what their disease is, whether it's obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, or diabetes, or, or TBI, you're going to find some differences in their brain from a, even a well-matched control group. And that doesn't necessarily mean that those differences are related to the disease you're looking in an individual patient. When you, when you pull research data, that's a little bit, um, a little bit better. Now, the comorbidities that, in, um, that are associated with traumatic brain injury, as we all know, as practicing neuroradiologists, we have a lot of people that are repeat offenders in our ED with multiple traumatic brain injuries. Mm -hmm. So it's not usually their first clean TBI. Um, substance abuse um, and psychiatric illness is a huge overlay in, these, in this population. Mm -hmm. And that is also difficult to tease out in statistical research. Um, there have been studies that have tried to do that. And some people advocate that your control group should be a clean control group. Unfortunately, when you have a clean control group with no comorbidities and your population of TBI has a lot of comorbidities, that presents a problem when you're doing a statistical comparison. And um, something that recently came up actually at the ASNR meeting just recently um, in May in Boston, um, it, it was discussed um, about the differences, um, the, the importance of effect size and population variability. So the effect size in mild TBI of DTI changes um, is relatively small. So you look at the research studies and the changes that you're seeing um, are relatively small from normal. Unfortunately, those changes that you see with DTI in the setting of mild TBI, again, moderate to severe, it's a little bit different, but in the setting of mild TBI are below the vari population variability that we see with our control groups that are used. And on that note, that control group is actually very difficult to acquire and to keep because you need to have a control group that is well matched to your individual subject. Sure. So you can't just use a control population of patients ranging from the ages of 18 to 80, and, and then you have a 24 year old subject and use that you know, control group with a huge range of ages to compare to that individual patient. You need a control group that is similar in, for example, education level handedness, hopefully, you know, in comorbidities. So if the patient that you're uh, scanning has hypertension, ideally the patients in your uh, control group should have hypertension. And that control group, unfortunately, has to be reacquired every single time you have a magnet or software upgrade because DTI metrics are highly dependent on your magnet strength, your, ma your DTI acquisition, and your software that's, uh, that's on your magnet. So let's say you, you know, upgrade that magnet, you get the next version of the, of the software package, then at that point, that control group that you have acquired has to all be re-recruited and scanned again to be used. That is a huge barrier in the use yeah, of DTI. That sounds like a mammoth task, you know. Uh, so is there any hope for the future? Um, the, 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 the hope is, there is a, a small amount of hope. The okay. hope is that there are, yes. 
Um, so, uh, um, my, my opinion on this is that longitudinal studies are going to give us better results than cross-sectional. So um, when you are able to image a single individual on the same magnet with the same protocol um, uh, longitudinally, then we can start to see um, changes in the DTI related to traumatic, that could be related to the traumatic brain injury, um, and using the individual as his own control. So that's, some, that's somewhere where there is promise and people are working on that. Um, we, I recently, um, it hasn't, it's not out for publication yet, but um, myself and Dr. Shumit Neoji um, with a, a consortium group um, here at Wild Cornell recently published a paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery, which should be coming out probably any day now, that uh, did just that. We imaged uh, professional football players, but we had preseason scans and we had post-concussion scans. Um, and those were the only players that we were able to see any changes. When you analyze the players uh, as a cross-sectional group, cross-sectionally, we didn't see any changes in the DTI that were significant. And then there are higher order metrics in DTI that um, are on the cusp, things like diffusion kurtosis imaging, which I'm sure a lot of our viewers have heard about, um, which are not easier to do, uh, but may give us more information. And that is a more, I would say, recent, but more relatively recent uh, research field when it comes to mild TBI. And um, that's a whole other discussion, so I'm not going to get yeah. into it. No, I, I think that's great. And I hope that you guys keep on working on it so that you can write the second paper or for the practicing radiologist, how to do and use DTI in the practical world. But um, yeah. we are really glad that, you know, uh, there is a lot of work being done uh, because there is potential. Um, and finally, I want to touch on another future direction, um, the standardized reporting and data collection of TBI. Um, and I know some of uh, the readers and the viewers either cringe or are completely like, let's do the standardized reporting. I'm not going to declare which, which side I am on, but I would like to know um, from um, you some of the pertinent points of this effort of standardized reporting for TBI. And again, how important it is for us radiologists to use consistent terminology. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm um, I'm on the fence as well, uh, to be honest with you, Chala, as to whether okay. or not we should be using standardized reporting for everything. Being a practicing clinical neuroradiologist as well, it does increase the, the amount of time it takes me to, to dictate a report when it's standardized. However, um, there are some um, huge benefits for standardized reporting. Um, we've seen that in with like the generative spine imaging with standard nomenclature. But in traumatic brain injury, one of the bigger benefits of using standardized reporting is that then you can actually um, uh, uh, improve the ability to pool data for future research. Um, it's very difficult to go back and pull all this data if everyone's using different terms. Yeah. So um, the um, common data elements have been developed by the ACR and the, and the ASNR as well. And um, we'd like, we use these common data elements for TBI RADs which um, the goal of TBI RADs is not necessarily to standardize reporting. That is a, um, a, a side product and we standardize it for a reason and that's more for the research side. But the goal of TBI RADs, at least the more short-term goal, is to provide a more evidence-based management scheme for patient disposition with mild TBI. So um, the, uh, the problem that I've encountered in my practice is that um, here at New York Presbyterian, um, every single patient who comes into the emergency room with a mild TBI and it has um, any amount of hemorrhage, whether it is um, a, a focus of subarachnoid hemorrhage in the, in the frontal sulcus or a trace subdural hematoma, they all get admitted to an ICU bed. Um, and that is a huge drain, yeah, that is a huge drain of financial resources um, and, and obviously takes up ICU beds in our hospital. The neurosurgeons here at Cornell hate this, but they can't uh, get away from it because that is more or less standard, th standard treatment um, across, across the country. So what TBI RADS, which is an ACR Head Injury Institute initiative that is co-chaired by myself and Dr. Christopher Whitlow at Wake Forest and Dr. Shumit Neoji here at Cornell, what we're trying to do is to use, at first, retrospective um, data. Um, we're collecting thousands and thousands of scans um, patient information and patient disposition and uh, trying to determine 
what are optimal cutoffs as far as how much subarachnoid hemorrhage, how much of a subdural hematoma can be present before you can safely discharge the patient. Um, and we are now in currently in the end stages of the data analysis. Um, and we have put together, similar to BIRADS or PIRADS or LIRADS, we put together a scheme, depending on what you see on your initial head CT, um, including some demographic factors, like whether or not the patient is very old or on anticoagulation, and including some of the clinical factors, um, how we can best using, um, at currently, retrospective evidence, but hopefully to be um, parlayed into prospective evidence, um, how we can best um, triage these patients to save money, save effort for our clinicians, and also um, do, do the best thing we can for our patients to, to make sure that they're, uh, we aren't discharging them inappropriately and them having complications after they leave. Well, that, that makes perfect sense. And again, kudos to all the efforts for, you know, you and your entire team that's working on it. And we will, will wait for, you know, us to tell, uh, you to tell us how to read these in a more standardized manner. Um, so I do want to say a big thank you to Andrew and John for joining us. And I would encourage the readers to definitely uh, read this paper. Again, like I said, it's a bread and butter, something that all of us should know, but then there is a lot happening in the future that's gonna change our practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Charlie, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Bye.